I was fresh out of college, ambitious, hardworking, and in debt. I applied for hundreds of jobs and attended dozens of interviews, all the while working the night shift at a 24-hour convenience store. But I kept hitting the brick wall of not having the right experience. It was so frustrating. I knew that I could do 90% of what the job specs asked for. The other 10% I was sure that I could work out when I needed to. It was a no every time though, and it didn't matter how many times I read on feedback emails that I was very talented and the interviewers had enjoyed meeting me. Each and every rejection sucked. I didn't need compliments, I needed a job. So I wasn't feeling very positive as I filled in yet another application form for a job that I had seen online. It wasn't even a proper job. It was for an internship with a research company, unpaid for about three months. For the experience, I told myself as I fought to finish the form. I finally did. Just before I had to leave for work, I pressed send, and then I threw my coat and hurried out the door. The shelves would not stack themselves. The next morning, I was dragging myself into bed when I noticed that I had a reply to my latest application showing on my phone, thinking, at least the rejections are getting quicker. I almost didn't read it, but my finger twitched and I opened it, and to my amazement, I was told that I had been accepted onto the internship program. All I needed to do was read and accept the terms and conditions, but I mean, who does that right? I scrolled down and accepted, and then rolled over and went to sleep. The alarm on my mobile woke me up at one in the afternoon. I couldn't remember setting an alarm, but obviously I must have. And then I thought, the internship, and I rushed to look at the message again. There it was. Please arrive promptly at 3 p.m. for your induction. And this was followed by an address. It was way out of town, but thanks to the alarm, I had time. I am so on it, I told myself, and I hurried for the shower. As it was, I was almost late. There was a line to get through the security checks at the entrance to the building. The place didn't look anything special. It could have been a stock image brought up from a search for a big faceless office building. When my turn came, I was asked to empty my pockets and walk through a body scanner. This was a fancy looking piece of kit and it gave me a 360 degree going over. I felt kind of violated to be honest and as I stepped out, I was about to protest that I had consented to being searched in this way when I had remembered the terms and conditions. That had been a long, long list and I guessed in there somewhere there had been a line about intimate electronic searches. Better than a latex glove up the butt. I decided and accepted a lanyard with my face looking out from it. It wasn't a great photograph. I was wearing my sweatshirt rather than the white shirt and tie that I had on. Hang on, I thought, and I turned to ask one of the people at the security desk where they had got this picture from. When I heard someone say my name, the Allen Chambers. The woman who had spoken was maybe 30 and had a dark blue business suit on. Her blonde hair was on a ponytail and she wore what I believed are called sensible shoes. I wasn't checking her out in a seedy way. I was just, you know, looking. I blushed away. She seemed oblivious to my discomfort and held out her hand. I'm Jane Mitchell, though everyone calls me Jane Wan. Is that because there are two Jane Mitchells that work here? I asked as we shook hands. She smiled. Oh, there used to be. Now, let's get to work. Looking back, the short space of time between application, acceptance, and me actually sitting at a workstation and being assigned tasks should have made me realize that something was off. And the fact that they had a picture of me and I didn't know how they got it, it should have bothered me more. But I was really just too plain excited. After months and months of frustration, I was finally getting somewhere. The only thing I had was that I hadn't resigned from my job at the store. Hey, don't sweat the small stuff. I told myself and I focused on the task at hand. My desktop was showing 12 different shared screens, 
each one of a domestic setting and by clicking into one, I could enlarge it. The one that I chose first looked to be the view of a home office. There was an old fashioned calendar on the wall, a cactus in a pot and a bookshelf. I was clearly seeing this room via a camera on a computer. The next setting that I enlarged was a kitchen. It was a spacious room with pots lined up on a wall hanger in the background. My task was to observe the activity taking place and note down timings of anything unusual. I had been told that another experienced member of staff would then review the footage. Both the first two rooms were empty, so I decided to check on the third, and there was a young man a bit older than me. He looked to be working on a device while lying on the sofa. To me, the young man's behavior seemed perfectly normal, so should I move on to someone else and come back to him later, in the hope that he would be doing something weird? I rubbed my face, a habit that I have when the cogs are moving inside my head. This was tricky and fascinating. Oh, how's it going, Alan? I turned to see Jane Wan was standing behind me. For the life of me, I thought she had told me her actual surname, but Jane Wan had stuck in my mind. Okay, I said. I suppose. I guess I just need to get used to thinking in a certain way to be able to decide quickly what constitutes unusual. Jane one frowned and checked the tablet that she was holding. After a moment, she looked up and said, Your records show acute observational skills. I tried to remember the responses that I had given in the application form that she must have been referring to, but I drew a blank. I tried to look, if not wise and at least competent, and said, Well, of course, that's a key skill of mine. This seemed to do the trick as Jane one looked less perturbed and started to move on. There were more people at workstations that ran the length of the room. I guess she was a busy lady with a lot of people to supervise. But a question had just occurred to me. Uh, I said. Miss one, I mean Jane. She paused. Yes, Alan. The people I'm observing, well, uh, presumably, they know they're being watched because they must have given us permission. But won't that change their behavior? Jane one looked at me like I just slipped down a couple of rungs on the evolutionary ladder and said, They don't know that they're being observed, Alan. What would be the point if they did? And then she walked away. I rubbed my face. A whole host of new questions were forming. But they all got shoved to one side when the woman screamed. It was a small sound coming from my computer, and I could not spot who it was at first glance. And then one of the screens I saw a woman running into a room. I clicked to enlarge and could see that she was in a bedroom. A computer camera that was observing through must have been on a bedside table or a chair. Either way, I had a clear view as the man walked into the room. He was breathing heavily as he approached the woman. She backed away from him, but there was no place to go. And then he hit her, and he kept doing it. I took out my phone to dial 911 but realized I had no idea where this was happening. I stood up, looked around the other workstations. Would anyone else know? I doubted it, but I knew who probably would. Jane, I shouted. Get Jane one. I don't know if someone called for her or if she heard me herself, but a minute later she made herself over to me. I felt sick at what I had seen and I struggled to get my words out. A, a woman has been attacked. I saw everything. We need to tell the police. Give them the details. On the screen, the woman was alone again. She lay on the floor, not moving. I didn't know if she was still breathing. Jane did not interrupt me and did not ask any questions. I don't think she even glanced at the screen. When she spoke, it was in a calm voice. Sit down, Alan. Your job is to observe and pass your contribution on to the next stage in the system. We have to help, I gasped. The system will help. I believe that because I trust the system. And you, Alan? Yes, I replied. But, she talked over me, good, now please go back to work. 
The rest of that first day passed by in a blur. I felt disoriented and confused. I tried to concentrate on what I was seeing on the screens, but I couldn't stop thinking about the woman who had been attacked. Even though shortly after Jane had finished speaking to me, I watched as police or paramedics, I'm not sure as I didn't recognize their uniforms, I arrived and began to tend to the woman before taking her away on a stretcher. The system had worked, I suppose. Perhaps a neighbor had heard the screams and called the authorities. I did not know and by the time I left the building around midnight, after another turn through the body scanner, I decided that I would not be going back. I would email, say the internship was not one for me, and thank them for the experience. Some kind of BS along those lines. I decided to do this one I had a clearer head. But after I got home, I could not go to sleep for ages. And when the alarm on my phone went off, I woke with a start. I looked at my phone, saw that it was 1 o'clock in the afternoon. What the heck? I hadn't even set that alarm. I rubbed my face and realized that I had new messages. The first was from my bank. It said that I had received a payment. One that ran into tens of thousands of dollars. Enough to pay off my student loans in one fell swoop. What the heck? I said it aloud this time. The second was from Jane Wan. As per the terms and conditions you accepted, now you have formally entered the internship program. We have deposited in an amount equal to your debt in your account. Should you not complete the program, we will require immediate repayment with an administration fee of 80% of the original amount added to the outstanding balance. We look forward to seeing you at the office later today. P.S. Nice PJs. I pulled the bed sheet up to my neck and looked at my laptop. It was open and facing me. I just about made it to the toilet before I was violently sick. Resigning there and then was now out of the question. I had been screwed financially before I joined the program. I had another 80% and I would be haunted by debt for decades. I was pretty angry by the time I arrived at the office that day. The security guard who processed me gave me a dirty look throughout. What's your problem? I snapped as I stepped out of the body scanner. Just concerned about your heart rate and temperature. They've been through the roof for the last two hours, he replied. How? I began, but I had no need to ask the question as it daunted me. Like a lot of people, I had an app on my phone which registered how many steps that I took a day. That and clearly much more. I went to the restroom, turned my phone off and decided to take the battery out as well. Swearing under my breath, I went to have things out with Jane Wan. I had a growing list with a spying on me at the top. A man that I had never seen before was waiting for me outside of the restroom door. He held his hand out, displaying all the signs of a very good dental plan and said, Hey Alan, I'm Tony. I'm your supervisor for the day. Jane, I began. I want to speak to... Oh, Jane is first floor. Today, you'll be working with me in the basement. If you'd like to come with me. He swept his hand in the direction of the left. I counted to ten, promised myself that before I left the office, I would find a way out of this mess, and then I followed him to the left. Tony wore a dark blue suit, a subtly striped tie, and black shoes. His hair was parted immaculately, and he smelled of something woody. I could feel the sweat gathering in my armpits and hoped he was wearing enough expensive deodorant for the two of us. The doors clicked open and Tony led me out into a gray corridor. For my exit plan, I needed options. I decided to try sounding him out. Do people ever drop out? I asked him as casually as I could. He looked thoughtful and after a moment's pause he replied, Self-termination does occasionally occur. Or sometimes we'll decide it's simply not working out and call time on an internship. It's such a shame when this happens, to see a young person become one of life's leftovers. Why do you ask, Alan? Are you thinking of leaving us? No, I answered. 
still trying to process what he had said. Tony nodded. I'm glad to hear that. We had reached a double set of steel doors and Tony was opening them by placing his hand on a scanner fixed to the wall. They whooshed closed to silently and we stepped through into a massive open space. Lines of desks with laptops on them ran the length of the room. There were seats by the desk. I noticed that each seat had restraints on the arms and that there were more restraints by the legs of the desk. Something cold touched the back of my neck. I reached around, realizing that it was sweat trickling down my skin. What was this place? I wondered. Tony, for his part, being like a proud parent on a word's day, he clamped his hands together and said, Today, Alan, I'm going to introduce you to our latest project. I can tell you there is significant excitement about it on all levels of the organization. It could, we believe, significantly improve the way we run the country. I held up my hand. Wait, I said. The government runs the country, the people that we allied. He looked at me with what seemed like pity in his eyes and then shook his head. Alan, he said. The men and women you see bray into the camera every day. Are you seriously telling me that they are fit to run the country? I could not answer. This was one shock too many. He must have taken my silence for acquiescence because he went on. This building is one outlying office of the most effective administration there has ever been. We have been covertly in charge of this country for more than half a century, and that is why this is the greatest nation in the world. He slapped his fist into the palm of his other hand, straightened his tie and said, Now, if you will move over to the wall and stand behind the safety line. I looked to my left. A red line had been painted on the floor. I had a very bad feeling about this, but I did as I was told. My legs felt very shaky as I moved behind the red line. Tony joined me, still beaming. A buzzer sounded, and at the far side of the room, a large shutter door had opened. The smell hit me instantly. It was something rancid. I wanted to ask Tony what it was, but I could not speak anymore, because the first of them had appeared through the doorway. Their clothes were filthy and torn. Each had a lanyard. These were not held on by a cord but fixed with a bolt directly into their chest. Their skin, where it was exposed, was shriveled and in places, fallen away completely to reveal the flesh beneath. None spoke, though their mouths moved constantly. Tony must have seen my attention was fixed on this because he leaned over and said in a quiet voice, Their tongues are clipped during induction. I looked at him blankly. There were men wearing overalls and carrying long tasers flanking the things that had entered the room. If one had started to veer off to the side, it was shot back into place. Soon the smell of burning flesh was added to the foul, sickly sweet odor that now filled the room. I was aware that my heart was beating at a crazy speed, that I was now soaked in sweat. But all I could do was stand and stare as they continued to shuffle forward. I was too scared to move, too scared to even speak. Prodded and shouted out by the men in overalls, the things each sat at a desk. As they did so, the restraints clamped close around their wrists and ankles. Eventually, all of them were seated before one of the laptops, which were now powering up. From where I stood, I could see images start to flicker on the laptops, one after another in rapid succession. Slowly at first, but then picking up speed, the thing started to press the keyboards in front of them, one finger at a time. Soon, they were in sync with the changing images. My god, I realized. They were responding to what they were being shown. The, the they, I tried to say. The, the, they are... Absolutely amazing, Tony said. You see, Alan, the zombie brain is uncluttered. It doesn't worry about what the other zombies think. It isn't distracted by romantic or sexual feelings. It doesn't have personal ambition or fear. These zombies are ideal. For what? I managed to ask. To help us create the algorithms that will guide every aspect of the lives of people all across this country for years to come. 
I couldn't respond. I stood and stared as waves of fear passed through me. I can't tell you how long the zombies were kept at their task, but when a new buzzer sounded and the restraints clicked open, I felt a glimmer of hope that the worst was over. I had no idea that this waking nightmare was only just beginning. The zombies got slowly to their feet and were herded towards one corner of the room where there were no dust. Once again, a buzzer sounded and a hatch had opened in the ceiling. A glistening slab fell through and then another. It was meat, I realized. Blood dripped from fat chunks of matter now rushing towards the ground. The zombies did not hesitate. Afterwards, Tony took me back to the lift and up to the ground floor. He got me a can of soda from a vending machine and told me that it would help us settle my stomach. And then he said that he would see me tomorrow. I did not go home. I walked the streets for a long time and I'm still walking. It's close to dawn and I've decided that I'm not going back to the office. I'm going off grid to somewhere remote. I have to do this. I have to get away. Tony said that the interns that don't make it become life's leftovers. Seeing the zombies feeding, I understood what he meant. It was not the way that they tore at the meat with their teeth or the drool speckled with bone and gristle hanging from their chins. It was when the meat was released from the hatch in the ceiling and it landed in a pile on the floor. It was glimpsing the movement among the other slabs of meat, the hand raised, the terrified face, before these zombies began their feast.